Yeah. And then when I, I decided um, uh, to retire from um, the uh, retire from the geological survey after three contracts of three years as, as a director oh, okay. at, in 1999 and do something different. Okay. And then I got involved with the World Bank okay. for 10 years. And now I'm supposed to be, my wife says I should be retired, but I work <coughs> for the Global Water Partnership and a little bit for the European Union and a little bit on odd projects, you know, strategic <laughs> projects, but not too. Yeah. It's a, different, it's a different sort of track. So I'm very interested these days in the, in the interfaces between research and policy, you know, and how do we, and how do we get better, how do we value better hydrogeological research so that it gets better into policy and gets more respected as a, a, as a contribution. So in this sense, I have a question, in fact. Yeah. It's, um, what the, which do you think that are the main um, research issues mm. of urban hydrogeology? Of which urban, 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 urban hydrogeology? Urban hydrogeology. Yeah. Well, um, I, th I think the challenge here is to, uh, now you may not call this research, but I think they still are research in this context, understanding the dynamics of the linkages you know the di as you're doing here the dynamics of the linkages with the wastewater system the wastewater system and drainage systems understanding the 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 dynamics and evolution of the changes in recharge and with urban development you know the, it's it, i think the the there you have enough research tools to deal with the aquifer but dealing with these linkages in a, in a realistic way so that we can better predict potential problems rather than describe them afterwards and model their evolution, yes. I think is the most difficult thing and it's still not easy. Um, and there's a lot of money, I mean, this is one of our, one of our problems, I think, that you know, particularly the good researchers who don't often re reach the interface they don't realize where the big costs and the big risks are, you know, and if you, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I, the vision on that, I mean, and, and, and therefore they don't realize how valuable predictive work can be if it's correctly focused and, and, and sufficiently, um, if they're, they're sufficiently well calibrated to be able to be predictive. I mean, this whole business of, of, of wastewater treatment and, you know, the, the Veolia people here, yeah. you know, they, 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 they've got big contracts to put in plant and they need to understand water flows and, and they need to understand chemical flows. Um, and it's not, although the basic underlying scientific concepts are not difficult, actually integrating this sort of information and, and, and understanding why the things are like they are now and how they would respond to changes is quite still pretty demanding. Yes. It's real research in that sense, more as it were synthesis than analysis, but it's a lot of stuff to bring together. Um, I don't, because I think that the, you very rarely see, I mean we talk about in Stockholm all the time, in the seaweed and in the, you know, the Stockholm water, we, we talk about integrated water, water, urban water management and integrated water system management. But what do we mean by, by that, you know? The, what do we mean? And what we mean is, you know, understanding in detail and taking advantage of the, or, or avoiding problems of excessive water flows or taking advantage of, of wastewater flows and nutrient flows and so on, and viewing the whole thing as if it as if there were benefits throughout it to be had, not just problems and costs. It's and, it, and it's that's pretty demanding scientifically, yes. as you know, right? To actually get that together and to be able to be confident of how the, the system is working is a pretty big. Uh, I have a big smile because I think that this sort of interview mm. is transforming for me in a class. And I, oh, I'm I really, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. I really like it. Yeah. It's it's really fantastic. Yeah. So um, uh, it's something that uh, well, it usually is like this when you are focusing mm. a tree. You are not seeing the entire yeah. forest. Yeah. However, 
we tried to uh, propose the Olya, but we have to to arrive to some reliable uh, research results. Uh, a long time collaboration in terms of because uh, in our opinion, for example, you can cannot do management groundwater management without modeling. Yeah, very sure. And very sure. of course, modeling mm. has to be based on good conceptual thinking yeah. and good identifying uh, relation in yeah. between and so yeah. on. But uh, um, so thank you. It's uh, it's uh, no so it's uh, really positive what I what I wanted to say. Yeah, I mean I think that the uh, I mean I mean totally agree with you, with you that we it's it's impossible to do that level of management and and and, and examine enough scenarios and begin to close in on the uh, a better vision of the you know the of the integrated process of water and urban areas without like, modeling i mean you know I'm, I'm very pro but i think that the that the modeling needs to be quite sharply focused towards some of those key key issues and the sensitivities that's all i'm saying you know you need to know what where if we get it wrong or if things change where is it really going to hurt the, yes. the, the, the people that, you know, live at that interface? Um, and I think it's probably the, the it, it, it's probably the, the overall ma management of, of the drainage of the, of the city, the overall management of the, of the wastewater, uh, flows and where you invest and how that investment turns out, which is where our greatest value would be in a city like this one. Um, there, it's different when you're in a very arid, arid area with, you know, where water resources are everything, you know, you, it, it, it's some, some of different dynamic. But I, I, I do think that you, you need to set the research very much in the context of the, you know, in that local context. We should do it now. I mean, you know, you have all the contacts, but it's not always the case. Sometimes yes. people will, will almost model to see to what extent they can... Yes, this is the, one of the <laughs> most common practices. <laughs> see yes. what extent they can, they can, they can do this, but not focused around trying to get outputs and reduce uncertainties in decision making in certain areas and um, perhaps almost to make make the system you know more complicated than the, or perhaps to over complicate it in some areas but at the expense of leaving out other things that could be very important you know, you see what I mean? I, I think it has to embrace the right sort of scale and the right sort of uh, sensitivity. But I'm not, I'm not a modeler. I've worked with an awful lot of models and uh, uh, models and modelers and in teams. And I'm thinking back to our, some of our early experiences in modeling. Um, and what I would call, and forgive me the simplicity of my language, because you're much more sophisticated than I am in your thinking of the formulation of models, but we suffered a lot, in, certainly in my days of major practice in the UK, before I worked overseas more, we suffered a lot from models that were superficially calibrated, but then trying to operate them outside their calibration for scenario planning. Is it, you understand what I mean? Yes, and that was a, a very common error of groundwater work in the UK in the 1980s, for example. Um, uh, an example, we, we were very interested in using, trying to use the chalk aquifer storage for river regulation and helping in environmental flows in, and water supply in low weather. In other words, using it as a reservoir, pumping out. And we had the models, I mean, chalk is always difficult, it's a fractured aquifer and so on, is a quite high primary prosody but quite low, spe low specific yield. We had to, we had reasonable calibration of the bottles in, under natural conditions. 
um, under the normal annual cycle. And we thought we had the structure right. Um, and we used those, or some people did, I'm saying we was collectively, the hydrogeological community in the UK in the 1980s, used those to try and demonstrate that we could, how cones of depression would work if we over pumped for some periods and then yeah. pipe the water out to the aquifer and put it for environmental flows downstream. And the mistake we made, or, or that was made, um, was the tempting one of worrying an awful lot about transmissivity and transmissivity distributions and not, uh, not looking at variation of T and particularly S with, with falling water table and dewatering. And, you know... That's changing. Yeah, <laughs> and, and changing a lot, particularly when you've got consolidated materials. And so we ended up, I remember it very well, we ended up with what I called in meetings you know, eff effectively a load of paper water in our national water plan. Because when you try to pump it out, it wasn't there, the storage was not there. In other words, we were, we were, we had pretty sophisticated models of, for those days, it's a long time ago, of groundwater surface water interactions. But the whole conceptualization of the storage in the, in the groundwater reservoir yeah. was wrong. Too simple. It was based on a few pumping tests at high water table. Yes. Yeah. But that, you know, but that, that was the, what I'm getting at was that was, we were at the state of the art at that date, you know, it wasn't any, that was the practice, and, but we had it completely wrong, and I still think that that sort of curiosity about making sure that we do understand all, all of the parameters, and we don't have super, over superficial calibration, uh, is a, 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 an issue on occasions, and particularly not at research level, but an awful lot of the use of models outside. You know, you said the other day to me that maybe you have to have a, a trade union of modelers and only these people should be able to use them. But you know, in reality, in consultants, everybody's using them. Absolutely. And when you, I, as an advisor, look and evaluate some of those things on behalf of governments, you know, they're, they're still so. Uh, either not calibrated or so superficially calibrated that they're using them way, way outside the, any, any real bounds and they haven't, they haven't looked at sensitivity at all, you know, it's just like put some numbers in and yes, press a button absolutely. Uh, and that still goes on. I mean, we were then researchers working using our new models but without an adequate um, three-dimensional data set for the type of problem that we were trying to address. Yeah. And we probably did not, you know, we, it was obvious, we should have been saying to the water company and to the water, National Water Resources Bureau, if you want to exploit deep storage, we have to have appropriate testing to understand what the storage is. Absolutely. But, you know, oh yeah, we'll do it, you know, we'll model it. We'll, <laughs> and we didn't have enough knowledge. So, uh, so uh, that made me very cautious about um, not the use of models, but thinking about where the sensitivities were and keeping within the uh, the framework of, of calibration. We're talking too much. Are we recording all of that? We still have time. So until the end. Yeah. I have another yeah, question. Sure. Fact, so you can cut this, this off. Is, with cut uh, it right down. Uh, yes, they will be the specialists. Yeah. So, uh, what I'd like to ask, you, in fact, is um, related to. Um, the idea to try to bound scientific people and universities, research centers mm. to, to the water regulators mm. and uh, water decision makers and in respect to urban hydrogeology to yeah. try to, to, not to impose, but um, sometimes it's really difficult to make them understanding that mm. they have to follow several rules or yeah. several uh, Conceptual thinking and general conceptual thinking. Yeah, and the, your and the integrated conceptual thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do think that in this, if I could just take one step back, I think that most places I've seen in the world, and I would include England in this, I would include China today and other places. So I'm not, you know, saying advanced versus not advanced. I think it's general that the water resources agencies. On the whole, and this is not their fault, they're not sufficiently well financed and staffed 
to be able to get into the detail of urban areas. Yes, they do general monitoring, general regulation, but the dynamics of urbanization and the complexity of urbanization make it a special problem. It's not like managing water resources across large rural areas with irrigation use. It's different. The, the whole dynamic is different. The anthropogenic effects are much more complex and so on. So, in the end, I, I don't think this is a simple... When you're talking about urban areas and urban water management and integrated water management in urban areas, this is not an issue on which necessarily you can expect the water resource regulatory agency to be the dominant the dominant party organizing everything and you've got to have more stakeholders more actors involved so this is the idea of a consortium or a sitting panel and obviously the utility has to be a major a major player and those people who represent municipal infrastructure you know it might be various offices of municipalities and, and other players, if there's major industrial centres, the industrial use, and so on, that somehow or other you've got to bring those people together, first of all, around a watery agenda. I mean, they often meet on other, other things, planning things, but around a watery agenda. And the people who are most, either more responsible or more suitable for that process. But then there's a the question of how they get informed. And if they meet without information, it's not all that helpful, particularly in areas related to groundwater, because groundwater is always a little bit misunderstood and uh, misconceived by people who haven't uh, uh, had much experience or, 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 or study in the area. So I think that the ideal arrangement, if it can be achieved, is that if there is an academic centre in the, in the city that has interest in this, that they are bound into that consortium and with a responsibility both funded to and a responsibility to provide information to that group and advice on request um, and interact with it but accept that in the end it's those people who have to carry the the responsibility for the financial decisions and the other things so it, it, it almost serving that that function and it may be that you need you have to have more than one university because there's competition or, or, or maybe a national institute in a university but what I'm saying is that a, a panel meeting around a complex subject like the functioning of groundwater in a city and how it's affecting its development and its daily operation and its new projects is not going to work well unless it's well informed and, they, and therefore there's an obvious role there. So I, I see that as the, the sort of ideal model for taking the subject forward. Um, and I, I think that without that, you couldn't, it's unlikely that you'll get one agency, particularly the Water Resources Agency, to be able to operate at the level of detail and with the amount of looking at all the linkages to be able to, to, to you know, mount good projects on their own. Uh, said in the case of London, not uh, uh, example, we were fortunate at one stage that we had the Greater London Council Engineering Department because of their flood fears. We had the Water Resources Agency because that was their responsibility, though they didn't really have the operational capacity to do everything in London. And then we had a, a strong water company, Thames Water, involved, and the Geological Survey and some London universities. So with that, you tended to have the right sort of table and interaction to be able, or to, be, to have less risk of omitting something seriously from your, in, you know, in trying to integrate your, your, your vision of to what extent groundwater was important and when you needed to consider it and, and you know, where were the, the big trends that were going to introduce risks and costs. I think that's the, the sort of model, and I, it's in Asia now, they, one or two of the Asian cities are doing that. Manila, at last, because Manila has a lot of water problems, um, although it's a wet country, the Philippines, and Bangkok, I mentioned, they put in place that type of arrangement, which I think asks the right questions of the researchers and the people who know about groundwater, and gives the people, those people also the right platform to present their results.
You know, they just don't just publish it or put it in papers. They they actually have to present it to the people who are most affected by it. So I, you know, I'm, that sort of dynamic I think is necessary. Um, but it may vary. It'll vary from city to city who is the who is going to take the lead or push for it. Uh, and I, I thank you. Mm. It's uh, really interesting. In fact, you mentioned you already mentioned something mm. yesterday and. Um, I, and I'd like to ask you, in fact, um, the, um, if you'd like to tell me the nicest story uh, at the level of uh, urban management that uh, you, you were involved in. Well, I think, to be honest with you, in recent years, there's this Bangkok experience has been, and, and, and let's be frank, if you're working with the World Bank and a team, you're an advisor, you're a, you're a catalyst, you're a facilitator, you're not doing the work yourself. Uh, I'm not pretending that, that my presence there was, you know, the deciding factor. But I think that the, uh, for many, many years, you know, falling water levels and land substance in Bangkok was a major concern. The city is at sea level, it is subject to surges, there had been a lot of flooding, there still will be some flooding from the land as well. But something had to be done about land substance, and then therefore something had to be done about groundwater abstraction, but not just abandoning groundwater abstraction, trying to move it to a, a lower total level, and to a more strategic level, and to get it correctly balanced with other water supplies. And it was by no means a trivial task in a fast developing sort of Asian uh, city. But I think, and originally the water, um, the, the, the groundwater group was always good. It was one of the ones that always has been, you know, working hard at the job. But they were very poorly positioned to influence anything. But their movement more into a, 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 an understanding and a regulatory role with more power and the recognition of the water companies, the municipal authorities and lots and lots of uh, groups of residents that something had to be done led to this you know, big change when you think about it, from moving from almost unregulated well drilling and use for um, multi-residential buildings, factories of all descriptions, to a fully regulated and charged use of groundwater, with a plan of where you needed to reduce the abstraction most, where the substance areas were worst, a plan where you had to, you know, that you needed to close wells in these areas, and but you could keep uh, uh, abstraction going in others. A plan effectively to re redistribute groundwater use. A plan to introduce water from outside the city to compensate, and to actually then, you know, produce the results that you've seen that, that over the last five years they have unquestionably stabilised. Uh, uh, a, a water table and are actually using something as original as price charging to try and tune the tune the to, to get a, a level which makes sense for the uh, for their for their urban reality I think that's quite an achievement now I was only involved in encouraging that process facilitating a little bit helping a little bit with the positioning of the groundwater department within the local area but I, I think that was very satisfying in the sense that you could actually uh, a, a, a situation which most people thought was going to you know lead to abandonment of certain areas of Bangkok through you know ha has seemingly stabilized but they've had their blows because after having done that they had this massive uh, inland rainfall and river flooding, it's a floodplain, yes. river flooding from the river, which was not the problem that we were trying to address with the land substance. We were trying to in address sea surges, which are more risky and more frequent in the area. But if you look at the data, they have basically changed the picture of an, an urban area in a period of five or eight, eight, eight 
you know, certainly within one decade. And I think that, you know, that, that's what we would always wanted to do there. And the credit goes to the local ties, but, but uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice story. And we need more positive outcomes in terms of getting groundwater, managing groundwater levels in the interest of the different interests of the, of the various stakeholders in cities. There, there must be some sort of uh, optimum engineered level which balances the interests of drainage, uh, avoids subsidence in that case, um, provides adequate water supplies at low cost, you know, a, a, an optimised balance. You, you, you know, you, there, there is one if you think about it, there is a, 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 an optimum position to look at the balance of these interests so that one does not predominate over another as it was previously. Cheap water was a thing that was predominating there, too cheap. Yeah. Sorry, there's a long answer, but uh, yeah. that's what I, that's well, what I feel. Thank you very much, Spirit. Yeah. I really do thank you. Yeah, well, clip it, clip it, clip it. <laughs> good, good. Let's get on with that.